Right, so a bit of a change of topic from my normal uh, geology. However, I couldn't get away from it. Uh, so effectively, I've uh, tried to blend uh, archaeology with geology. So it's probably not a geoarchaeological talk, it's an archaeogeological talk. Um, one of my uh, great loves has always been archaeology. If I wasn't a geologist, I would have become an archaeologist. Um, but you couldn't make any money out of archaeology, even though it's very interesting. And this uh, talk, uh, gestation's got a few, had a few years. Um, effectively, I uh, was looking at uh, a plan of, uh, well, reading a book by Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer on Mysteries of the World book. And I piqued my interest when I saw this particular big uh, arc of um, stone hinge, uh, hinges in England. I thought, oh, been doing a lot of uh, work on arcs and rings and things in geology. And uh, thought at some, one of these days I'll uh, see if I can put all that together and, and see why they built them in big rings or big arcs. <coughs> I wondered what our ancestors uh, followed when they built these. Why, why would they build them in big arcs? Um, uh, the whole country was uh, just a mass of trees back then, so uh, you'd think they'd just be scattered all over the place. So I'll take you through um, my thinking, I guess, on uh, why I think uh, civilization didn't start with farming, as is absolutely um, the, what people think these days, but actually started with mining. Um, Starting off with, uh, along that line with current paradigms of um, civilization's beginnings, what people think about how civilization started. Uh, one is that it started sporadically in a lot of different areas. Um, wasn't any sort of communication much between areas. Didn't start from an advanced precursor civilization. Uh, nothing like uh, Atlantis ever existed and um, it uh, flooded and therefore the, um, they had a head start. It all started from uh, scraping together flints and things and eventually farmed enough uh, to get a surplus then they could start building. No advanced civilization existed before the Ice Age, around 10,000 BC. Um, civilization began after agriculture uh, got going about six to seven thousand BC, and however the Copper Age began only four to six thousand BC. Therefore, the use of any copper before this time was sporadic and incidental, and really didn't have much to do with uh, when civilization started. Um, as is true in the modern world, uh, the role of metal mining is uh, generally discounted. Um, Human nature suggests it's very important. I mean, uh, Australia's iron ore produces more um, revenue for Australia than all of the farmland in Australia put together. So if you think about the uh, ecological uh, implications of that, well, we won't get into that. Wouldn't want to start an argument. <laughs> <coughs> so research objectives. I just like researching stuff that uh, I can get a bit of an argument out of. Um, so who built the megalithic structures? Stonehenge being the prime example. Uh, when, where did the early copper come from? Uh, was the metal mined uh, locally? Um, how can we prove that it was mined locally and how can we prove when it was mined? Do the hinges and mines follow structural geology? And the premise of the whole talk is that if the earliest hinges follow the mines, then this suggests that metals catalyse civilization. Pure and simple, I mean, that's got to be it. Just like uh, you don't get a town of Kalgoorlie up there because of the pastoral industry. You get, up, get a town there, um, advanced town up in a place like that because of mines. So first of all, uh, we'll look at where these people originated, what they look like. Um, how can we find that out? Uh, very interesting. Suggestions of a flooded, pre um, we'll look at the suggestions of a flooded precursor advanced civilization. 
So uh, went uh, ransacking the internet and uh, came up with uh, a lot of stuff for this talk. Um, and there's just been an absolute huge advance in all of this data. So whatever you believed in about 2010 is absolutely old hat now with their genome studies and all of that stuff. Um, are able to be able to get DNA from uh, people, you know, 100,000 years ago or more. <coughs> so the appearance of the megalithic stones uh, in Europe um, correlates with the movement of peoples in the R1B haplogroup with uh, current Europe, African and West Asia uh, characteristics. Um, we'll have a bit of a look at that later. The oldest uh, Neanderthal ceremonial sites, well, has to be Neanderthal because uh, our group didn't exist 175,000 years ago when these stone rings were um, built 330 metres in the pitch black of the dark of a cave in France. Um, they were consisted of hundreds of stalagmites broken into a standard length um, point four, and it was built up to a height of about 16 inches or about 0.4 of a metre. See the little fireplaces they had there? Gives an idea of the scale of it. It's probably um, 10, 15 metres in diameter. Uh, so was there a flooded ice age precursor civilization? Or anyone who says there wasn't uh, uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. So effectively, um, over the last uh, 20 years, there's a thing called Splash Co has been going in Europe and they've been documenting and uh, digging up all these underwater sites. And there's uh, over just monoliths, not, not the total amount of sites. Uh, that's these ones here. There where proper big monoliths and stone structures have been found all under the water all around Europe. So the glacial maximum uh, finished about uh, 19,000 years ago and started heating up. Sea level rose, uh, sounds a familiar story. However, the, uh, the sea level has been very static really for um, nine, 10,000 years. Um, which effectively uh, wiped, uh, so when it rose uh, about 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, it wiped out this civilization. Uh, it's very interesting that the, uh, a lot of the civilized, most of the civilizations um, actually occurred on the land out from where there are mines and where there are um, you know, mountainous coasts. So we'll look at a monolith, just one of the 3,000 um, that's been discovered halfway between Sicily and Tunisia, just 40k from Malta. So we're talking um, 9,300 years ago, this area was actually submerged. Um, we've got a 15 tonne, 12 metre high monolith, yeah, pretty much the length of this room. Um, the interesting thing is uh, that uh, it's not just a monolith, but it's actually got a hole bored right through the middle of it from one end to the other. Now, 9,000 years ago, um, theoretically, they just had rock tools. So, yeah, well, why would they do that? And I guess that's just part of the evidence of a flooded precursor advanced civilization. just to say that there was an uh, advanced civilization that got flooded. So just advanced and how extensive was European civilization by 9000 BC. I mean, uh, I did ancient history um, and so 4,500 BC, you're looking at Mesopotamia, absolutely the first civilization on earth. That was what we were taught. Uh, we're looking at double that length back um, so what's happened in the last 20 years in this place, in uh, Golbeki Tipi, um, but uh, in Turkey here, 
have actually found all these absolutely amazing um, uh, Stonehenges, I guess. But Stonehenges are absolutely totally bland, unadorned circle of rocks. Uh, these, these particular rocks have got fantastic carvings all over them. They've been really thoroughly dated to 9,600 BC. Um, and then it uh, spread from there all over until they got to Stonehenge at uh, 4,100 BC, a couple of thousand years before Stonehenge was built. Till they started digging at Stonehenge and then they found at almost the same age as this, they found uh, big holes uh, where there were totem poles, or they think there were totem poles erected, round between 8,500 and 7,000 BC. So this ancient advanced ancient civilization was much, much more advanced than what we give it credit for. Uh, not to mention uh, Atlantis uh, Tartesis, which uh, I did a bit of a paper on, uh, ge geologically trying to find rings that they could build the city in and lumped on the area around Cadiz, and that's where most people think it is. That was destroyed by a flood around 9,500 BC, told by the Egyptians uh, to um, Solon from Greece. Um, now, why would they have that date? And they said they had, uh, Egyptians said they had the priestly records that said that's exactly when it happened. If you think back to the, when the, where, uh, all this flooded, that monolith, that's almost exactly the same date. Um, now we go to the other side of the story, uh, very briefly. Who were the oldest farmers? Um, so if we've got civiliza advanced civilizations in um, uh, at 9,500 BC, when did the first farm start? Now the farmer's argument starts to get a bit sticky now because effectively the very first farm, that was only detected by the fact that the, this guy ate some stuff that they thought might have been produced on a farm uh, in 8,000 BC, so one and a half thousand years after these civilizations that we just saw. Um, but most of the farm, early Aegean uh, European farms, they're only six and a half thousand BC. Um, so, and what were the people? Well, we knew they were the R1B group. Um, and when we think about our, all our ancestors, we think, ah, oh, well, you know, you had the Neanderthals and you had the, um, you had the uh, Cro-Mangans and you had the um, Homo sapiens that we are coming through and they're all, we all look the same and therefore they must have all looked the same. Well, in these various uh, diggings that have been going on around here, I um, just uh, snipped out the heads of some of the um, different people that had, uh, uh, this, this one here is about um, three metres in size, very much like the uh, Central American um, heads. Uh, but I'd say either African or, um, or uh, East Asian. Uh, this guy here, I'd say, well, apart from the Mickey Mouse ears, he's got, uh, I'd say he comes from up Norway somewhere. Uh, this one here, obviously Middle Eastern. And this one here, well, you can't mistake that person as anything other than East Asian or Mongolian uh, type. And so I actually thought about all that and so I looked up the looked up uh, composition of people in Europe and uh, just like really recently they've done genetically uh, genetic stuff on them and they found that there's little uh, tribes living in little areas very close to each other but they didn't mix for uh, something like 20,000 years. They were there for a long, long time and just didn't mix. So that's suggesting that uh, right up to this point, civilization hadn't started. So the earliest civilizations were the most advanced and extensive. Uh, this area in Turkey, like Tassie is a couple of hundred or maybe a bit more kilometers in diameter. Well, the area in Turkey where all these uh, ancient cities have been found is 200 kilometers in diameter. 
So you're looking at uh, big, a big area, 9,000 BC these are. So in 7,500 BC, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, Cataholic, uh, 7,500 BC was an advanced residential city of uh, five to 7,000 people. Uh, you know, this is not just a lot of tents or cave dwellers. And this, uh, the other one, uh, Karahanti, in 9,500 BC has 250 obelisks that they've dug up so far, showing 3D human stylized figures, folded arms, figures of foxes and serpents, but the interesting thing was, and they're up to 11 metres high, these are the actual uh, obelisks there. They weren't uh, carted and, and uh, put there, they were actually dug out of the, the hill was dug out from around them. Uh, lots and lots and lots of people working together, nine and a half thousand BC. That's that face that's sitting, uh, sitting down in this big pit that the, um, they made as a, a, probably a temple. We're not talking about carved figures, we're not talking about little uh, you know, trinket type stuff, we're talking about big, big figures, megalithic figures, a very advanced civilization. Um, other th thing uh, that happened right back then, it's nine and a half thousand years in Gobleki Tipi, uh, that uh, symbol there is used a couple of hundred, um, well, two thousand, so um, seven thousand years later, that figure was used as the uh, word for God in this uh, Luwian people's script. That's their, that absolutely definitely was their word for God. And that's uh, so on the, the belts that were, went around these big tall figures in uh, Gob, Gob Ekli Tipi, uh, that's that symbol, that's that same symbol. And interestingly, uh, the oldest, um, world's oldest continuous society from 50,000 to the present day, it's the Aboriginal society in Australia. Uh, we know that the, uh, they've traced their heritage back to India, but they obviously would have come from before there. And they can't have come, they can't have uh, come after 9000 BC or thereabouts when everything flooded. And yet they've got exactly the same symbol on their Chiringa shields and messages. And that actual, in their language, that meant uh, ancestor in visible form. God, uh, whatever it is. But uh, another one I read said uh, the, uh, the supreme being that dwells in the Milky Way. So they all, all tie together. In actual fact, I went right through and saw, um, I filled up about three pages going all over the world with that same symbol meaning God or a heavenly being. And it first appears in these civilizations. But uh, we know that 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 couldn't have happened instantaneously. So that's uh, nine and a half thousand years ago, it was still well used. Um, so were these uh, huge, uh, I think there's about uh, 14 or more of these big rings that they've dug up, Gobleki, uh, Tipi. Um, and the three that they've dug up, they've found that they're actually uh, built on a ge uh, perfect isosceles triangle like to the inch, and uh, effectively you can't do that with haphazard, it's a well planned, very well planned and built um, temple area. So civilization much more advanced than our assumptions. Also suggests that uh, because they, when they left the place, they, it wasn't ransacked, but they didn't want anyone to find it or Somebody might have defeated them and didn't want anything, anyone to find it. A little bit like um, uh, people hacking off the faces of uh, icons and stuff that they don't like in Christianity. So anyway, the whole area was buried uh, very um, right over the top and so it was only recently found. So it suggests they were a powerful, peaceful society no agriculture yet, not to say they don't have wars. The Romans uh, had the 400 years of Roman peace, <laughs> um, defended very vigorously by wars. 
So a summary of the human history, uh, oldest um, footprints go back six million years, oldest skull 4.2, we've got our stone rings and art back to 64,000, music 35. All this time uh, we've got ourselves a hunter-gatherer society and there just doesn't appear to be any change until you get to around 10,000 BC, at least on land. Uh, so what happened around uh, 10,000 BC? It wasn't agriculture because that started afterwards. So we'll uh, leave that question hanging at the moment. And uh, so if the hinges followed lines and arcs, um, we'll look at that. Uh, what, were they, what were they chasing? So if you build a hinge like that is, that requires a hinge being Stonehenge requires uh, lots and lots of people, lots and lots of work, lots and lots of spondooly, um, effectively not going to be gathered, uh, gained by uh, hunting animals. Um, so lands out of Europe, um, I've blackened everything off so that the hinges uh, that have been plotted, they show up. Um, well, uh, they very definitely in lines. Uh, they zigzags and nearly always with that same angle, this angle here between the two, this angle. So oh, I've seen that before. Anyway, the uh, mystics reckon that they, they, they knew all about this three or four hundred years ago. They'd plotted them and said, oh, they're mystical ley lines and lines of force and all this sort of stuff. Um, so why are they like that? Uh, what are the following geological structures? Uh, and are their minds on them more importantly? So I plotted uh, some on the map of Europe. Um, one thing that uh, I did see was that the um, greatest concentration of hinges uh, in, under the water, um, you, uh, the ones on the land, they're usually associated with the ones under the water. Like you don't find any underwater ones there because there's no land ones there, but you find lots of them around here, you find lots of them there. So what was the common thread there? Well, common thread is that the new ones came from the older ones. And as the earliest land civilizations are the most advanced does this suggest that the old, older ones were also advanced? It seemed very strange at the 9,000 when everything was flooded and at about the same time on the land there was really advanced society. To me it goes without saying the ones that were flooded would have been advanced, apart from all the monoliths. So I thought, uh, well, trying to tie it into mines, uh, what's the best way to do that? We'll, um, look at the Europe's ancient mining areas and the close correlation with the hinges would suggest the metal was mined um, locally and was important. Um, and the webinar question is, did mine, copper mining in particular uh, kickstart modern civilization? So these are the mines. I, I went back and um, through heaps of different stuff to try and find where all the ancient mines were, um, quite a task. England was pretty easy, they were all on one plan, but Europe, they were scattered all over. Uh, that's the best I could come up with, and there's probably more, but these are the old ancient mines, uh, pre-Roman mines. Um, so if we plot them up with the hinges, do they correlate? Uh, well, I skipped a slide there, time constraints. So they do correlate and uh, they correlate, uh, the mines correlate like extremely well with the hinges and particularly the advanced uh, hinges correlate very well with the, the mines. This is the area where these uh, cities are, big gaggle of copper mines there. Um, so obviously if, they, if you've got a lot of copper floating around, copper was probably would have been like gold to the ancient people uh, like gold is to us. You could make all sorts of stuff out of copper. If you had copper, you were the king of the roost. 
Um, so there was lots of extensive trading routes around. So you, Portugal traded stuff with England, uh, Spain traded stuff with Norway, um, Italy traded stuff with Spain. All over the place you can track uh, different articles that were traded. Uh, Europe itself was more than likely reasonably impassable at that time, so it's pretty obvious that they would have been, um, uh, I'm talking about 9000 BC or thereabouts when this first started, would have all been carted by maritime trade. Um, so implies that uh, they got ships of a reasonable size and the skills and technology um, to do this much greater than we currently assume that they had. Got ships from uh, Norway that have been uh, pictograph. You've got a, I think it's the Essen um, a reed boat, which has uh, actually been dated at 8000 BC. It's in a museum in Holland and it's a big thing. It's not just a, a little dinghy. Uh, most interestingly is the Aboriginal um, wall art in Australia has got almost identical looking um, ships with people on them and they're not small. Um, and that they, well, they're in the older period, period of Aboriginal art, so probably around 8000 BC. They must have had them to get across there and yet uh, the Aboriginal people as a whole were not mariners. Um, by the time we got here. Um, human nature never changes. Uh, what is, uh, I've forgotten what they are, but I'll probably have them all, the uh, four deadly sins. One of them I think is greed. And uh, so if you have a read of that, uh, you can get a bit of an idea of so Alexander sort of 320, 330 BC. He sacked uh, Persepolis, uh, which was Darius's main, um, main um, city. Um, and he took uh, just part of the treasure, 4,700 tonnes of gold bullion, 150 million ounces, $300 billion. And now why would he want to, why would he want to, um, uh, invade that place, you'd ask. Well, pretty obvious he was after wealth. Um, oops. Um, and when you read back through the empires of Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, India, which I've done, right through to Russia, and I'm sure still goes on, but uh, politi politically incorrect to probably mention, uh, they all gained their wealth by effectively stealing the gold from the people that they defeated. And uh, what Alexander took in that one load with 20,000 mules and 5,000 camels, absolutely nothing like the Spanish took from America. So empires um, only conquered and held areas that had mines. So mines were really absolutely right through our history being the most important thing Six successful empires had division, are you listening, governors? Divisions of prospectors and geologists to find mines. Romans had whole battalions of prospectors and geologists who knew uh, the country to find their mines. Well, I could go on all day about that, but I better not. Uh, ancient, ancient metal mining and trading blocks. Um, we know where the tin in Cornwall went to because there's been isotope studies and tin in Cornwall, uh, probably right through its history, uh, went all over the world, but the study was done in Israel and uh, Turkey and uh, the bronze from there actually had Cornwall tin in it. So that was one of the main supplies of tin back in the old days. So evidence for copper mining uh, catalyzing modern civilization was well, just really a matter of timing. Uh, if you go back to the farming, farming started uh, seven to eight thousand, um, or six to seven thousand BC, and uh, mining started. Uh, these red dots are the cities that actually had uh, mining tools and artifacts and 
um, they're um, 8,000 BC, 10,000 years ago. So you're talking a couple of thousand years difference. And um, to me, that's uh, clear evidence that mining, not agriculture, started advanced civilization. I mean, when you, when you mine and you got yourself a rich deposit, I mean, um, Alexander, he had a mine back in, in Greece. And, and he, um, we think of a million ounce mine. Boddington, say, Alexander had a mine in Greece that it's been calculated he mined a million ounces a year for his whole life from. So we, we think of, uh, you know, huge mines as being huge big things to get stuff out of. But they were just so rich, those old mines, that uh, they were the things that absolutely were the things that catalyzed civilization. So new civilization paradigms uh, started from a precursor advanced civilization formed before the Ice Age, the advanced civilization began in Turkey 8,000 BC after mining uh, started. Agriculture only started about 7,000 BC in a fairly minor way. Couldn't provide the surplus to enable an early advanced civilization. So my premise that metal mining and trading did start modern civilization. Oh, I'd like a uh, few arguments to de debunk that one. All right, so now we're going to find the geological reason for the location of the mines and hinges. So we've already showed that the, that the uh, mines and the hinges are really closely related. So I'm going to look at the structures that the hinges are on, which where, where a lot of this stuff started. So they, they were the uh, hinges. That was the original uh, landsat that I took to get my um, uh, enhanced images. Um, and I, so I overlaid the mines over the... Um, Brit so we're going down to Britain now. Um, See, that was the, the map that I originally looked at and uh, we found that the mines don't really follow the surface geology. Uh, this is just back to the um, back to the uh, different um, linears that the mines do follow, or the mines do the mines follow the same linears as the hinges. So in a global sort of manner, we've actually said, yeah, the mines are associated with the hinges, but um, if we can see that the uh, hinges are actually built strictly along the, th the structures the mines are on, then that gives it a closer relationship again. So this is the mines plotted on the hinges. Um, so they sit beside them there, um, but they're still plotted up this uh, very strong line. Only one mine up here, a uh, few mines there, some mines down there, lots of hinges all around them. That mine, the, the Great Orm mine in Wales, um, every other mine in Europe went bankrupt when that mine started. It was so rich they transported their copper all over Europe. Uh, so, you know, it'd be like finding a 10 ounce, 20 million ounces, it'd be like finding Kalgoorlie as an open pit these days. To put it in perspective, you'd be mining uh, five, 10 th million ounces a year. So economics did prevail. That mine sent every other mine, copper mine broke. Uh, that's evidence that the hinges do follow the mines and the lines. <coughs> so I'm going to uh, do a bit of um, enhancement on the uh, Landsat. Very quick look at the uh, method of enhancement. So I start off with a um, Landsat and I gradually refine and get it so that I can look at a quite a thin plane of focus, probably plus or minus 5k, as opposed to very broad scale uh, focus that you get on these plans. Um, and when I've done that, I end up with uh, England uh, lands that actually looks like that. So uh, there's a big circle up there, centre of it's there. 
called that the Loch Lini Ring, because that's where it sits. Uh, over here we've got the Loch Re Ring, excuse my Irish. Um, so that, that ring's about that diameter and perhaps with a bigger ring around the outside. This one here is the centre is there and this ring here, which the mines are all on that we just saw actually sits out there. If you draw the radiuses to that, they point exactly. So, so none of this ultra detail is visible in normally enhanced Landsat. Very privileged you lot to actually see this sort of detail just came from good old Google Earth. So a quick uh, look at the, the way the hinges associate with the rings. Um, associate exactly like the mines do with the intersections of the rings. Uh, they follow around the main ring angles. This one was particularly telling, it's a small ring down here. But the only few hinges that are there actually follow around it. So I thought, why in the heck, uh, they're not just following, they can't see those rings, why would they build the, there's no mines out there, so why would they be building hinges way out in the middle of the wash area in England? So the question was, were there old mines out there? Great geochemical prospecting to all these hinges. Um, you'd bit of reverse psychology and uh, you use them to go and prospect very well documented, best geochemical um, survey you've ever done. This is just the um, mines on the rings. So follow the, follow the, they're on the ring where the ring hits these uh, long uh, north-south ones. So we're firming up the structures that the mines lie on. So we're going to go down 80 kilometres depth. It's at 80 kilometres depth, right? Oh, well, good on you, Bob. You're down in the uh, mantle now. Not much chance of finding anything down there. However, you get down to 80 kilometres using this uh, tomographic little snip out of that big tomographic plan. Uh, exactly the same rings again centred on uh, this one out in Ireland. Uh, so the geology at 80 kilometres is still just as brittle as it is at the top. Contradicts the current theory of a mobile mantle over which the crust is constantly, constantly sliding. In fact the linears were so match the ones in the Landsat at the top so exactly uh, that I didn't even bother have to, to change them. So structures are absolutely vertical. Um, the hinges even more so follow the um, rings and the linears. So exactly the same story as we saw up in Landsat. So say, well, how come, how come you get the same, it's almost like taking cookie cutting right through the earth with vertical, uh, strongly tectonic structures. So in, the, in these uh, enhancements, the actual, uh, the dark stuff is tectonically active country, fault shears, anticlines, all that sort of stuff that uh, doesn't reflect seismic very well. So we head across to Europe now um, using Landsat, so we'll quickly repeat the exercise. So same, same deal, put the mines on, uh, they're the hinges of the white on the various colours of the mines. You can see that the mines are following the hinge lines um, right down through here and, and also following the linears. Um, now, in the next few, I want you to particularly look in this area. Don't take your eye off the end of that arrow. And uh, that's what I'm calling the Aceda Ring in southern Sweden. So if you look, uh, like, well, you can see all these linears running through Europe. Like, this is a hugely tectonic zone here where Africa is colliding into Europe. How can you get these linears just going straight through that? Something doesn't quite, um, oh, something smells in the state of Denmark. Um, 
So you can sort of see a bit of a shadowy type thing there. So that's actually what you, you sits under the south end of Sweden. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the best concentric ring structures I've ever seen. That, that's sitting right on the surface, though, that feature. So if I was ever going to go and look at a um, look for a, an impact structure on near the surface, I'll be looking at all the rocks around that area. Uh, that's just by the way, but it, it's a beautiful example of a ring structure for those that don't believe in them. Um, you can, uh, and on the Landsat of Europe, you can actually see all these beautiful linears running straight through the north-south ones that run through Britain. You see a beautiful, uh, um, for geologists, uh, sinistral twist on the liniment that runs up there, suggesting that uh, whatever it is, whatever this is, very recent because all of these other linears, I mean, this area here is 30 million years old. Uh, sorry, is the uh, African collisions only sort of uh, 50 to 30 million years and are still going on and yet these big structures are heading right through and yet they've deflected around that so suggests it's a like really recent structure. Uh, the rings and the mines. Um, so you've got this big structure here, you've got the mines running absolutely straight down it. Got uh, structures like this with uh, little splays of mine coming off, and you go over the other side, and you've got them down there. It's a very uh, strong correlation between the mines and the rings. But the uh, ancient uh, civilizations wouldn't have known any of that. All they did was follow where the mines were. So when you plot the ancient civilizations on uh, the uh, centre of the Aceda ring, which is there didn't really show anything much, just a couple of mines. But there's, uh, like, because there's almost no, you've only got a limited time period between the end of the Ice Age retreating north up in Sweden um, and when people could actually do civilization, and yet you've got all these um, hinges up there right around that ring. So, like, so those ones are associated with that mine what are these ones associated with? I think they're associated with the Baltic Sea, unfortunately. So we'll have a look at the seismic tomography of Europe uh, from uh, 100 uh, to 600 kilometres depth. Um, so the uh, geophysicists, they uh, produce these plans through a great rigmarole and I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, basically, uh, because I can use these plans for, plans for my work. Um, so at 100 kilometres, uh, effectively, the mines are uh, sit sitting in the very um, tomographically active area. Uh, when I enhance it, I get, uh, oh, big structures, not a very good enhancement. I, Sort of run short of time before this talk, but you can see big structures running up there. You can see another big structure through there. Um, so do the hinges follow things? In, actual, in fact, you can pick the structures out when you plot the hinges on because there's a structure up there, fairly ill-defined, but the hinges are obviously following it. There's another structure up through there, again ill-defined, but the hinges are following it. When you plot the mines on, uh, uh, when you uh, toggle backwards and forwards between this one and the previous one, uh, half the hinges disappear. So that just shows the real correlation between the two. Go down to 300 kilometres depth. The actual uh, front of the um, collision now, the collision itself is still happening here, but the contorted turbulent flow front goes right out here. You've got uh, little, little rings, you've got uh, bigger, more tectonic rings, you've got very clear little rings, little, little ones all over the place, as well as um, the north-south. Uh, well, what's the rectangle in the top right-hand corner? Uh, that's, that, um, that's the 
300 kilometer depth thingy bomb. And I can assure you that's got no structure in it, Laurie. <laughs> well spotted, I should have blotted that out. Uh, once again, the hinges now are still following this big uh, fracture that runs right through. These ones are following this fracture system that runs up there. Uh, same story, we've got uh, these ones, Hebrid the Hebrides and all that, they follow these fractures. They're the actual fracture systems and the rings. I won't dwell on that. Uh, so we've got the um, down to 600k. So that, that's what you're looking at, Laurie. <laughs> Shows that I can enhance anything. <laughs> uh, interesting thing is that the big world circling, uh, what Tim O'Driscoll used to call a Tethan twist, is actually um, very visible in all this tomography. Like, really does stand out. And then seems when you get to past Europe, uh, past England in particular, it splays right out. It really doesn't reach North America. But you're now looking at a, a big front in front of the um, uh, front of the collision. And uh, well, we look at the what the so we take the hinges. They're rel relating to that one, still in the same position. English one still in the same position on a north-south trend and interestingly uh, the hinges seem to be following uh, rings. This ring has got hinges all around it. Uh, summarising, um, that was a bit, bit fast at the end there but uh, I think I thought I was just repeating myself too much. So summarising uh, the new civilization paradigms are, which are hopefully a lot more people will think about, that civilization did start from a precursor, advanced civilization. Civilization formed during the Ice Age before um, about 10,000 BC. In fact, to get to that advanced, uh, you would have thought they would would have uh, formed quite a few thousand years before that. And so how did they get that, that advanced? Um, the absolutely certain that the only thing that could have made them that advanced so quickly uh, is metals mining and trading, giving a surplus, around 8,000 BC. But I'm, I'm betting because a lot of those other hinges next to mines, the earlier ones, that they were actually uh, picking up the native copper straight out, out of the ground and selling it and uh, building themselves up the cities of 7,000 7, people around themselves. Uh, Larger scale agriculture only began after about 7,000 BC, but absolutely couldn't provide the surplus to suddenly support this explosion of um, advanced civilization. And the uh, logic of the hinges following the mines, uh, so you find a Kalgoorlie and the city will follow. Um, and the mines are, are like, ah, just a little bit of an aside thing was that the I did to sh really show that the mines are located on deep seated geological structures, not on ley lines. Uh, metal mining and trading started modern civilization. I'll now take questions from the floor. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, um, everyone, for listening, both online and in the room. And we're going to take questions. So I just want to remind everyone who is online to write their questions into the chat box. I've got some questions already, and I've got some questions from the floor. But there's an interesting thing on the slide before me, and there are some comments in here about your statements relating Ice Age and civilization. So, um, gathering from these questions, my question to you, Bob, is you have the statement up there in your summary slide about civilization 
civilization formed during the Ice Age before or about 10,000 years BC. And so the question is, is this a relationship between the mining artifacts that are around that time and civilization? Or is it the relationship between civilization and a weather event? And is this something that identifies climate change and the relationship of civilization? Well, I'm a very, I'm a very politically uh, correct person. <laughs> so I'd say yes, it definitely um, there was a huge climate change going on at the time the Ice Age stopped. Uh, makes our piddly little um, fractions of a metre rise in sea level look like um, you know, a teacup compared to what happened back then. So if we're panicking about uh, you know, the sea level rising a metre in the next hundred years, imagine what these guys, and they were advanced civilizations living on the plains in the North Sea and these other places, as the huge big monoliths have said. Um, when the sea started rising a metre every 10 years, a metre every hundred years. Like, uh, we, we um, really a storm in the teacup, most of the stuff to do with climate change. But, uh, when you actually look at it in a historical context, sea rose uh, 140 metres in um, as many centuries and totally flooded these people out. So that's my answer to climate change from a geological perspective. I'm not saying that climate change is not uh, pretty dramatic. I mean, yeah, I guess a you know, quarter of a metre rise in sea level is um, pretty dramatic, isn't it? Because the sea level, for the first time in, in uh, hundreds of thousands of years, actually stayed static for 10,000 years. And that's probably got a huge uh, impact on um, civilization because you can't have you can't have uh, civilization if you've got the, your coastline going backwards and forwards. Well, before I, um, I go to the next question, I guess my take on that is um, we have some positive uh, changes in civilization coming then in the next metre of sea level change, hopefully. Um, well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, um, get ready for a real prosperous time because effectively uh, all the great empires in the world have always occurred during when there's been about a four degree rise in temperature. As soon as the temperature drops, uh, the empires go bankrupt because all the crops fail. Mind you, the mines don't fail, so they've still got a, another string to their bow. So there's good. always two ways of looking at things. Um, but. Um, people will try and make uh, political uh, mileage on things. That's my take on it. If the sea level was dropping, what would they say? All our ports will be stranded. Okay. Anyway, back to the uh, question at hand. Back to the questions at hand. Have I got a question from the floor? While the floor is thinking about the question, I will look at the next questions from online. And I have a question here, which is the relationship, I, th I think it relates to slide 14 and your time chart where you had uh, going across fr the change from hunter gatherers to agriculture. Um, and then you talked about the key lines um, relating to the above sea level stone hinges. Can you just explain you mentioned 400 years ago they figured that out about the key lines? The ley lines. The ley lines, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, well, and possibly long, long before that. That was just a figure I plucked out there. But, uh, you know, you have uh, Stonehenge, you know, lines up with the solstices. Um, and they did line up with different things and they line up Glastonbury with Stonehenge and then they'd line up the others and they line up in a perfect line. So they, the thought, thought there was that they were astronomical because they were in lines. Well, they might have been astronomical, but uh, the actual lines are astronomically long and there's no way they could look across the uh, North Sea from England across to um, Norway uh, and from uh, England down to uh, southern France 
and see that they're all in line there. So they're all built on lines, but it, uh, they didn't know why they were building them on lines. They just built them where the mines were, where they got the metals. And the metals were on line. When they got there, no doubt, uh, they had enough money to think about um, astronomy and all that sort of stuff. And because the mining, the, the farming had then started, then they wanted to know when their crops uh, were ready to crop. And the uh, pillar six from there is when the sun's over that, that's when you start cropping. So it's a matter of power to the people that built them. Very good. Have I got a question from the floor? Okay. While we're on questions from online, so I have here quite bemused by the method of enhancing your images. What's the trick to doing this? Uh, no, no trick at all. It's uh, all I use is the tools on PowerPoint. Um, I've been told by very good authority I should be actually using Photoshop, but uh, I'm quite happy with PowerPoint because it works. Um, and it works a darn sight better than anything that anyone else has come up with at the moment. So while, while I'm on it, I, uh, I'll keep using PowerPoint. So if you go to PowerPoint and you click on, click on your um, image you want to enhance, and then you go up to the top and you click on um, picture, and a picture effects or something like that. Go across to the left uh, above the home thing and it's got uh, artistic um, effects. And you click on that and it'll come up with a whole series of different uh, things you can do to your image. Um, and I've described that, all that on my website, uh, geotrex.com.au. The trex is a, just a K, S. Um, so I won't go and describe it again here, but there's no trick to it. There's just a lot of a lot a lot of hard work um, to actually do it. Every, every stage you go it might go through heaps and heaps of iterations, and every one you've actually got to manually do it. So you go through one iteration, but there's probably six or seven sub stages to that that you do. And I've told people how to do it. They've sat down and tried to do it, but they haven't been able to. Next question. Um, you commented about Neanderthal stone circles um, being built in the darkness of caves. Can you elaborate again on the size of them and, and I guess some comment about how this was achieved and, and whether or not you would call that um, some level of advanced civilization? Uh, um, 175,000 well, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely advanced over not doing it. And, uh, you know, why would you build a 10 metre or whatever it is diameter circle, you know, like a 330 metres inside a cave with no light whatsoever? You wanted to be very secretive about something. Uh, so the Aborigines, when they want to hold, do their men's business or women's business, they go off and into a place no one else can go um, and do it. So I would, uh, you know, inference, I guess, is that those cave, deep cave uh, um, hinges or whatever and the paintings, I mean, why would you go and paint uh, the paintings, you know, 14,000 BC, beautiful animals uh, miles and miles in, la in, in a cave where nobody can see it. It's basically, once again, to give you power over your hunting or whatever, but you didn't want the common person to come in and see it. It was uh, taboo, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, next question. Just grabbing the microphone. Oh, question, uh, Bob. It's certainly an interesting uh, presentation. But getting back to the, you know, the geology and the opportunity for, to find, you know, new mines. Now you're talking. <laughs> you have to ask the question. Um, has, you know, that, that the work with the, the hinges and where the mines are then led you to say, well, 
there's a lot of hinges here, but there's no mines appears of any significance. Therefore, maybe there's um, something that needs to be drilled. Uh, well, that's the whole aim of aim of all of my talks is actually for something to be done. Uh, like my, the Australian plan that I showed of the 300 kilometre depth um, targets. Uh, like, uh, so what I do when I, apart from the lines and the circles and all of that sort of stuff, I look at what the, I look at the uh, tones and the, um, oh, I guess I look at, at everything. And so on this 300 kilometre depth plan of the Yulgarn, I noticed that Kalgoorlie sat on a, a certain toned uh, piece of um, tomography down there that actually hotter, was a hotter to tomographic tone than all around it. Then said, oh, that's interesting. And Cambalda sat on one, Norseman sat on one, Menzies sat on one, Leonora sat on another one. I said, oh, there's a real sequence here. So I sort of fine-tuned that plan until I could find all of those ones. And then I put a circle around them and a circle and lines where there was a big long line of them. And um, I've been told on good authority that uh, a lot of the exploration in the, uh, in the uh, western Yulgarn, you know, like uh, out towards Perth, uh, Julie Ma and a lot of those things around uh, Wongan Hills, a lot of those people have been using these targets because there's no other way you can, you can focus in by looking at stuff at the surface. The premise is that the, uh, the mineralisation comes from the core and it's coming straight up from the core. If you, so if you see something that, uh, sit, that all of the mines, all of the big mines in the Yulgarn are all sitting on something of a certain colour and texture, so well, you know, that rings a bell. I'm going to look for all of these other ones and there's no other way you can do it. And there's no other way that anyone else can do it until they can do what I can do with the images. Not big noting myself, I'm just saying that I'm absolutely astounded that the geophysicists and the geologists that, that spend billions of dollars a year can't do this on PowerPoint. Boy, I'd have some fun if I could get hold of an um, a MRI um, algorithm. I wouldn't know what to do with it, but I'll tell you what, the geophysicists would know exactly what to do with it and how to apply it to their gear, yet they haven't done it. You know, I'm just uh, totally frustrated with the mining industry in terms of the dinosaur type approach of what we're doing is good enough and it'll be good enough and, you know, what you're doing is different and uh, we don't believe you anyway. But a lot of people are, you know, I mean, you can look at that stuff and you can query the rings. You can't say that they're not there. You can query what they mean. So you've really just got to put it all together, which is what I've been doing, having a lot of fun. So and Bob, working uh, 16, 18 hour days, getting this stuff ready. Bob, um, question here, which relates to uh, Peter's question, is um, on slides 30 to 32, where you brought down your um, thickness of the slice that you reviewed down to f plus or minus five kilometres, and you had, I think it referred to the British Isles, and you had in the south, east corner, you had an area that had a whole lot of stone hinges, but no known mines. So is this an area you'd recommend that people carry on from Peter's question, should actually be having an active exploration program? And have you started some sort of syndicate that we need to get shares in? <laughs> so could you just elaborate on don't, that? It, are we picking up on the right don't thing? Don't tempt me. <laughs> I'm retired. No, no. I had my fill of that. Um, no, what you say is quite correct. I mean, uh, it did require a lot of work to build these things. And um, generally speaking, the biggest ones are where all the mines are, where they're close to where a mine is. Um, so if you've got uh, ones out in, you know, big ones out in the uh, boondocks effectively, um, and particularly if they're si sitting around a ring that, and a structure that should be a good, should be a good mine, then I'd be definitely getting out there with ge ground geophysics and 
geochemistry and every other soil penetrating thing you can find, that area is absolutely totally farmed. Um, take you 40 years to get through the environmental process to actually get a mine going, so that's probably why there aren't any there, but it'd still be worth looking. Scotland, um, you know. I mean, a, a lot, lot of Europe in particular is buried by glacial stuff, uh, glacial till and uh, huge outwashes. So you've got to be able to look through that. That's why this sort of process is very good for Canada and uh, Northern Europe and that. A question online is, um, have you considered that hard rock miners would have made good stonemasons? And so maybe that's where some of these stone hedges come from, the miners actually um, doing them rather than the, the general um, people Farmer. at the time. Uh, well, they would certainly be a lot better at it. Yeah. And being miners, uh, they're all wealthy, aren't they? So they've actually got the time to spare. Um, more than likely, they've got the tools to do it with. Um, I think that uh, various um, uh, metal tools were used a lot earlier than what they um, what they uh, think they were. Metal being so valuable, like a rock, if you go and break it in half, you're just going to leave it there. But if you uh, dull off the edge of a uh, chisel or something like that, you're not going to go and leave your chisel hanging around. You're going to take your chisel off with you to the next job. So I think, uh, you know, a lot uh, our history sort of um, I don't think people think very clearly about uh, how early things started and why metals should appear, metal tools in particular, should appear so late. They might be used for a um, hundred years, two hundred years before, um, or maybe a thousand years if it's a good iron meteorite or something before it's actually deposited on the ground in a camp somewhere. Oh, sorry, Norrie. Good eye. No worries. So, Bob, would you suggest that maybe those original civilizations were better at, at waste recycling or, or maintenance of um, um, the reuse of native metals rather than... Um, well, I'll put it this way. Um, if something's very valuable, um, you're not going to waste it. Um, yeah, no, it's probably not politically correct. There was a the reason that the reason in Australia that we've got so many kangaroos is only because people don't value them. If people valued kangaroos; they'd all be gone. They'd be on your plate. So effectively, yeah, the more valuable something is, the rarer it will become. Less valuable something is, if it's there in abundance, it'll just stay there. Any other questions from the floor? Well, look, um, I'm just looking online and um, there's new questions just come through. How did the large settlements of 7,000 people feed themselves without large scale agriculture? Is it possible <laughs> that evidence of large scale agriculture is lost to archaeology while the hinges and mining? Uh, artifacts have survived? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'd have to have a bit of a think about that one. So that would sort of imply that there was enough farming there to feed them. And what I'm saying is that there's not enough farming there to actually um, get uh, 7,000 people together. Otherwise, you would have found evidence all over that uh, 200 square kilometre area of just multitudes of farms, and there aren't any farms there for another one and a half thousand years. Mind you, farms don't last that long um, in terms of um, if it's, uh, I mean, the bush grows back over it again. So I'm not saying that farms aren't there earlier. What I am saying is that the farms aren't. Uh, valuable enough and the product that they, well, as I said before, the um, 
well, I think I did the study once when I was working at St Ives that uh, one, the, the production from St Ives in the gold fields of uh, 500,000 ounces a year we were producing. Um, and we, you, we uh, disturbed probably, I don't know, maybe 10 square kilometres at a guess. The production of all of, of St Ives was uh, the revenue from St Ives and benefit to the state, apart from labour and that, was actually greater than the wheat crop over all of Western Australia. So um, effectively mining uh, can be very concentrated and give a lot of wealth, whereas farming can't be, uh, to provide a lot of wealth, it's actually got to be very spread out to produce, and just by in fact you only get uh, one to five tonne of wheat from a um, hectare of land. So you can get uh, you know, 20 million dollars worth of um, copper or gold from uh, something the size of this room. I think that's a big difference.